You're 70 years old, married, and already retired. You've accumulated $1.5 million in retirement savings, but you're asking yourself the question, how do I create a plan that helps me feel comfortable in retirement? That's what we're gonna talk about today. Hello, my name is John Vandergriff. I'm one of the owners and the wealth planning team lead here at Blue Ridge Wealth Planners, where we help people answer this question, how do you create a plan for retirement that is specific and unique to you? And whether you're making the transition into retirement or you're like the situation we're looking at today where you have already made the jump in, it's never too late to have a plan and make sure that you're factoring in the things that are unique to you, but also answering some of the questions that you have concerns about. So as we look at this, you're gonna see a link below this video where at any time you can schedule a time to talk to one of our wealth planners here. We'd be happy to help you with any of the things that you have going on, whether you're retired or planning on that. Uh, but without further ado, we wanna go ahead and get into our content here. So, so as we build a plan, I like to talk about this in reference of building a house. Uh, just because there is a particular order in which you go about building a house, same for a retirement plan. So as we look at it, the most important part of a house is the foundation. And we believe that any uh, retirement plan uh, needs to have a good solid foundation. And that's going to be built on the goals, objectives, or even concerns that you have uh, that you would like to resolve. And so as we look at this, the key here is getting enough understanding about you and your situation, what makes you different from the other families that we help, the other families that are out there, uh, because I firmly believe there is no cookie cutter response that fits every person. So just like we really don't need cookie cutter houses out there, you need to make sure if you're building it, it accommodates the things that you need. But everything that we talk about from a goals perspective dictates what gets built on top of it. Just like a good foundation is going to dictate what type of walls and roof you eventually put on that type of, or that piece of property. So, so as we look at it, it's important to start here with goals first. And we'll ask you some questions or give you some questions to consider as you do this. But then on top of that, that's where you look to uh, start this, what we call plan for everything. And as we look at it, the walls or structure of this plan are really going to be uh, looking at the five areas, uh, which is how do we plan for and generate the income that you need? How do we make sure that we are investing money the right way based on the needs that you have off of it? How do we pay attention to the tax impact and try to minimize that as much as possible? Um, healthcare, how do we handle both short-term costs with healthcare plans, but then long-term costs uh, of healthcare in the future. And then the last, but certainly not least, how do we factor in uh, wishes that you have, both for while you're still alive planning, um, maybe if a spouse passes, what happens, but then how do we make sure that we leave a legacy, get the proper plans and, and documents in place to do that. So all five of these things are important as you start to have more conversations, you start to realize that these things do fit together very similar to walls of a house. So if you only have an investment uh, plan, you don't really have anything else, you may have one of the walls that's taken care of, but you need to make sure that you have uh, things here that are gonna fit together so that it can build out the things that you need uh, in the way that makes the most sense for you and the way that you're most comfortable with. And then if we do this right, and typically we have to understand what we need here, that will dictate what needs to happen in all five of these areas. If we build that plan correctly, then you will get what we call the three C's, uh, which is first, control. And again, you know whether somebody works with us or they're meeting with us, they always have control over what's happening. After all, this is your money. But we want you to have control also in the planning discussions because it does matter how you take your income how much risk you're taking overall, where you go about paying your taxes, how you draw out to cover healthcare costs and plan for the things in your family. You need to have control over that and an awareness of how those things can be working together for your benefit. If we are successful in giving the first C of control, then that will lead to the next C here, which is what we call confidence. Again, we want you to have good, confident uh, decision-making that you have moving forward both now and in the future. And you do that by having an answer to the things that are happening today, 
that gives you the ability to respond much quicker and hopefully better uh, than if you didn't have a plan at all. Uh, and then if we get the control and confidence right, it leads us to the last C, which is what most people retire for, and that is so that you can be more comfortable. You know, you could work the rest of your life and be stressed out, or you could put together a plan and make sure that you have the things that you need so that you can have a focus on being comfortable as you move forward. So as we look at this, Again, if we do this right, it's a progressive conversation. So we're going to talk about today, you know, how do we identify the goals that we need? How do we go through this conversation of identifying what things need to happen? And then, you know, typically when we work with a family and they agree to work with us, we start to actually build out the five pieces here. And then the end goal of what we want to accomplish is the three C's that protects very similar to what a roof does, the plan that you build, because Sometimes people look at the external things uh, like market collapse, you know, tax increase, you know, all these different things that are happening and say, oh, that's going to dictate how I go about and make decisions. Well, it can have some impact, but really the goals and objectives that you have should be what you make planning decisions on, not markets losing 10% in a short period of time, because hopefully you've had a right conversation about how you need to be invested before that takes place. So, as we look at this, we want to make sure that we are keeping the focus on the right things. And if we can get these three C's in place, it can allow you to feel better about how things work moving forward. So as we look at this, we always want to give you a starting place, especially if you're at home trying to work through this. We want you to have some questions that you can ask yourself and really think about this uh, as you move forward. And so in this particular situation, this couple is already retired. So the first question I like to look at is, what are you concerned about today? You've made this jump in. What are the things that are still keeping you up at night, the things that you're worried about, uh, things that you're hearing that you have questions about how you're going to respond to that? We need to identify those to see what type of solutions may be out there because it could be very simple. It could be more complex, but we need to understand the concerns that you have as you're moving in and experiencing retirement so that we can help alleviate as much of those as possible. What do you want to do? So again, in retirement, you may want to have hobbies, different things, travel. You may want to manage some of your money or you may not want to. So again, what do you want to do as you look at things moving forward, but also what do you want to make sure you avoid? You know, like this couple, as we're gonna look at in a second, wants to stay out of debt. You wanna avoid paying more taxes than you have to. You know, avoid running out of money. All those things are very important. We wanna make sure we highlight the things we do want and the things that we don't want and then see how we need to make planning decisions uh, to make sure that we get to do more of what we want to do and we get hopefully have less of the things that we want to avoid. So as we look at this, <clears throat> again, this is a 70 year old couple, I'm gonna write this a little smaller. They are looking to stay retired as their number one goal. They do not want to go back to work. They have gotten this bug and they like it. Uh, so then as we look at that, they also want to make sure that they stay out of debt. So again, a lot of people work hard to get to a no debt situation whenever they get to their retirement years. This particular couple wants to make sure that they ensure or they continue to do that as they move forward. Then they want to be able to do you know, some functional things. They want to be able to help out with grandkids. And the thing I always tell people as you make the jump into retirement, get good at saying the word no so that you can say yes to the things that you want to do. Because one thing that happens when you're retired, people say, oh, you know, Betty and Joe are retired. They can do this. And so they try to offload a lot of their obligations onto you. But you want to be able to choose some of those obligations uh, and make time for that. And then last one here has been more recently things that we've heard uh, keep up with inflation over time you know a lot of people have concerns about inflation we'll talk about how we go about addressing that uh, in a proper plan but again you know as we look at it there are definitely things that are subsets of these that we want to pay attention to but these are kind of the four primary things that they are looking to accomplish and so the first thing we want to come across is income and so what they need on an annualized basis, and this is including taxes, is about $84,000 a year. So for the math people out there, that's $7,000 a month that they need to be able to provide what they need today, but then also uh, be able to move forward 
and factor in inflation on top of that. So both of these are already taking Social Security at, you know, they're age 70. They actually start a little earlier. First spouse is at $34,000 a year. The other spouse is at $25,000 a year, no pensions, part-time wages. So as we look at this, they have $59,000 a year coming in uh, from Social Security. And so as we do the math here, the, the difference there is about $25,000 or a little over $2,000 a month that they need uh, from the savings that they have each year. So as we look at this, you know, from an investment savings perspective, they have put together $1.5 million. So as we look at this from a you know, income positioning, we wanna make sure they have enough money uh, to be able to provide their, for their savings. If we do the math on this, they need 1.67% a year from the $1.5 million they've put away which is a very good situation, a very low need situation. You know, we like to see this number typically be up to about 4%, but hopefully less than that. Uh, this is less than half of that, so that's a very good situation. Um, we just need to make sure that, you know, as we look at their income, specifically from what they take from their investments, they're positioned uh, to be able to actually provide that in a very consistent manner. So, so as we look at this, just so you can see kind of the thought process here, if we've got 1.67% that we need, typically we're gonna factor in inflation somewhere between three and 4%. So that means this couple, as far as growth potential, needs somewhere between 4.67 and 5.67%. So again, as we look at this, not crazy risky, or you don't have to be crazy risky to accomplish this historically, especially if you are willing to take some risk on your money. Uh, but as we look at this, the key is making sure that we provide this from a very consistent source, uh, but then also pay attention to the other investment options because if we're wanting to factor in for inflation, we may need to have buckets of money that are more aggressive. Uh, this particular couple is fine with up to a 25% loss. Uh, so as we look at that, that's what? Uh, $375,000, which sounds daunting, but you know, for them, they looked at it and said, you know, we, we feel very comfortable as long as we're over a million dollars because of the need that we have off of this. So they're willing to take risk for uh, this phase of life that they're in because of where their needs are. So as we look at this, <clears throat> the key to investments and making investment decisions is making sure that we have a connection between what our investments are, need to provide and then what type of investments provide that. So as we look at this, the three things that most people need uh, from investments are growth potential, they need accessibility, and then also protection or safety. So as we look at this, the challenge that most retirees have, even if they're in retirement, uh, because what we've benefited from is an extended period where markets have been pretty good with the exception of you know, 2022 and some parts of 2023, uh, so as we look at that, generally speaking, most people have had a growth mindset their entire life, and it's really hard to get them to change from that, especially as their needs change in retirement. So as we look at this, the two things that are essential for you to be able to get t uh, growth potential other than more money is time and a willingness to take risk. And so over your lifetime, as you're accumulating assets, you have time to let these accumulate. You have a willingness to take risk. That is very common to be in, in what you need for growth. But on the doorstep of retirement, most retirees do not have time and risk on their side. Now, this couple, because they have such a low need, could go more risky here than uh, the average retiree, if you're looking at it from that standpoint, because of how much they need off their money. And that is going to be something that would help alleviate some of their concerns because if we can have growth buckets that we do not need to touch, and that's the key, having growth buckets that we do not access, that is one of the best ways to factor in for long-term inflation because as we look at it, long-term inflation rates are three to 4%. Markets typically generate between eight and 9%. So that allows you to do that if you can leave it alone and not dip into it whenever markets are down. So as we look at this, we may not need all of our money here. We may have a pretty good chunk of it here, depending on the risk tolerance, but we need to make sure that we have ample money and access abilities and also protection instruments. So as we look at this, 
Access is what we need to make sure that we have enough money uh, to cover emergencies, especially for this couple. They do not want to go into more debt, so we need to make sure that we have plenty of accessibility. That's usually going to require uh, liquidity from the investment, but also not a huge amount of risk. You know, we want to take our risk in the growth buckets and then be in a position where we have less risk overall here. Um, so whether it's bank type positions, uh, managed volatility accounts where you keep a certain uh, risk range uh, with the way that you're allocated, those are the type of things that typically make sense here uh, because we will have you know emergencies, but also we need to factor in for healthcare costs if we're in a position where you don't have long-term care insurance or some ways to subsidize those costs. Uh, already, you need to make sure that you have the ability to what we call self-insure uh, from your investments. And we do that through, again, keeping money accessible, not crazy risky, uh, so that you can have access to it no matter what happens with market conditions. So as we look at this, access is very important. And then protection, you know, most people will want to have some level of safety as a part of their portfolio. Um, typically, we get this through insurance top positions today. Uh, but as we're in a position, even if, you know, this couple has a lower need, uh, we've got the ability to take income from our safe positions. That's one of the biggest values because you do not want to take a risk on the income that you need. But also, and we'll, we'll talk about this as we transition to ta uh, taxes, RMDs or required minimum distributions uh, for this couple is three years away, but that will be a time where once they enter this period, they're gonna have withdrawals uh, the rest of their life that they have to take out. And so this could be a good strategy to make sure that you can access this without a big market drop. And if you choose to take this money and go more aggressive with it, you know you can take it out without any risk potential. Um, like you would your lifestyle income because those are going to be recurring withdrawals that at least have to have the taxes paid on those distributions. You can reinvest it, but not in the same tax bucket. We'll talk a little bit more about that um, in just a second when we talk about taxes and tax planning. Uh, but as we look at this, the key is to not believe in some cookie cutter approach here that says, oh, I need 60 and 40. You have to make sure based on what you're comfortable with, but also the needs that you have, how much is the right percentage in each of these buckets, and then how do you utilize uh, the investments inside of each of these categories uh, that you are most comfortable with and allow you to accomplish what you want. All right, so, so as we look at this, going back to you know, our sheet here um, where we are talking about the plan for everything we've talked about income and investments. Now we want to look at, you know, the kind of income planning side. So like we said, $84,000 a year is what this couple is consuming. That puts them in the top tax rate of 12%. And as we look at this, savings and pre-tax accounts of the bucket, they're in a position where they have about 1.4 of the 1.5 in pre-tax dollars about 100,000 in bank top positions or after tax. No tax-free accounts today, like Roth IRAs, properly structured life insurance plans. And so as we look at this, the reality is this couple is in a position where they're gonna have to have a larger withdrawal than they need come out of their pre-tax positions when they get to RMD phase moving forward than really what their income would necessitate by about a little over double. So, so as we look at this, $25,000 a year is what they need now. When they get to retirement time, let's just assume their account balance was the same. It's a little less than 4% that you have to take your first year when taking required minimum distributions, which would put them around $50,000 that they would have to take out. That would force them to show a higher taxable income uh, than they do today. And again, it's one of those questions where if we know that's coming in the future and we know, relatively speaking, we have lower tax brackets, do, does it make sense to start paying some of those taxes early at rates that are advantageous for where we could be later? So as we look at this, we know that you know for this couple with Social Security, but then also with uh, the withdrawals that they have coming out in their IRA, they're gonna be somewhere between money at 10 and 12% from a tax rate uh, as far as what they have in today's money. So if they do conversions, they could do a pretty good bit of conversions in the 12% tax rate. And I think that will be maybe the lowest tax environment 
opportunity that they're going to have to pay those, especially if they get into a position where they're now having to have you know an income uh, that's coming out of over a hundred thousand dollars here. So as we look at this, you know we've got to factor in that, but then also where taxes could be in the future. So again, 2017 is in the past, but as we look at it, 2017 tax brackets are what we are set to revert back to in the year 2026 if nothing changes. And as we look at that, you know, really no change at the bottom here, but about a 25% increase in taxes in the 15% bracket. And then if they were future in RMD land having to exceed 111,000, you know, some of those dollars could get paid at the 25%, which would be noticeably higher um, than where they are now. And, and as we look at it, just to throw in comparison from not uh, this century, you know, the last time that we had higher taxes than what we've gotten used to was in 1981, where the top bracket uh, topped out at eight or 70%. You notice that there are more brackets and those brackets increase rather quickly under $100,000. Uh, so if this couple is in a position where they have, let's say, $100,000 of taxable income, their top dollar would more than double from where it is today, and they would have a pretty hefty increase on each of these brackets uh, that they're paying taxes on. So as we look at this, we want to be mindful of this because one of the things that we see often when people get to retirement is that the age-old rule of thumb about income is that your income will go lower. Their income did go lower but they're in a position where when RMDs kick in, they're actually gonna to have to show a higher income than they ever have in their retirement years where they're now having to pay taxes on a pretty good chunk of this income at a much higher tax clip than they thought that they would be obligated to. So if we can take more of this $1.4 million and really shift that down, it does two things that are beneficial. First, it lowers the amount of mandatory distributions that they have in three years if we're able to get good chunks of uh, money taken on this. But then secondly, it allows them to have more liquid after-tax money in the event that they have a healthcare concern. Uh, because as we look at this, this particular couple does not have traditional long-term care insurance. Uh, so you know, most people would say, as we look at it, they're not in a risk situation because they have their assets. But if taxes go up significantly, they still need this income and they need additional pools to be able to fund the healthcare needs that either spouse may have. That's going to continue to add to the tax problem that is created with RMDs and, and really add to that moving forward. So, you know, as we look at this, the amount of liquid after tax savings that they have today is a little less than 10% of their overall bucket. Um, and so that would be one of those things that we would like to see increase, hopefully in a tax-free capacity, but trying to see this become a much larger percentage of their overall savings pool so that they do have a good nest egg, emergency fund, resource, whatever terms you want to use there, uh, to be able to access in the event of emergencies, but also healthcare situations at some point in the future. All right, so as we look at this, beneficiaries, uh, are each other as primaries. Uh, then they've got two kids that they would like to have a 50-50 split uh, between those. They do have those reflected on their accounts currently. So if we did do something different with them, it would be important to maintain that and continue to have the beneficiaries reflected. They do not have uh, estate planning documents as we look at it now. So sometimes if we if we don't have that on the list, we will put, you know, complete estate planning. It's something that if you've not done that yet, it's very easy to do. Most people procrastinate here. Uh, but as we look here, baseline, you know, everybody that is out there needs to have a will in some capacity. Um, that, that tells your heirs, where to direct funds whenever you're gone. Living will is important to provide direction for whoever is making your healthcare decisions as far as what your wishes are. But the key documents that rarely get talked about are powers of attorney. Uh, you need one for financial matters so that someone can make you know, money decisions for you while you're still alive if you're incapacitated. 
and then power of attorney for health care so that somebody can make those end of life decisions and have the power uh, to go above and beyond what a doctor's recommendations are if it goes against the things that you want your living will. Now, yeah, nobody likes talking about these things because it is morbid. It is essential, though, to get these things taken care of in place, making sure that you notify the people who have these discretions uh, and then, you know, have conversations with them. You don't necessarily have to tell them how much money you have if that's something you'd like to keep private. Um, but it is one of those things where we want to make sure that we get that thing legal, especially from a power of attorney perspective, just so that no matter if you're in a coma, whatever condition you're in, if you're still alive, somebody can help you do and do all the things that make sense uh, for you as you move forward. And then as we look at this, you know, annual gift amount to charity or family members, one of those things that we will look at, uh, depending on the situation, you know, these people did not list out charitable contributions as something that they wanted to do. But when you reach the age of 70 and a half, you have the ability to take advantage of what are called QCDs. And that is an acronym that is Qualified Charitable Distribution. So this would allow you to have money go directly from the IRA custodian to the charitable 501c3 charity that you wish. And it would satisfy the RMD that you have when you get to 73, but also it would allow you to not have that increase your income uh, and then have a need for a deduction. So, you know, as we look at this, sometimes you take money out of a pre-tax account donate it, but if you do that, that's increased your income and the deduction that you get for that may not be above the standard deduction today, which for this couple is right at a little over $30,000. So unless they're getting sizable amounts of money to charity, they're really not getting any tax credit for it. So QCDs are a way that would allow you to get that benefit and then you know still get the full use of that standard deduction to try to keep that income number down as low as possible. So. So as we look at this, you know, these are the five areas. Obviously, as we go through this discussion, if anything else sticks out, the objectives and concerns is never permanently uh, full. You can always add things to that. Uh, but as we look at this, this now gives us some numbers that we can use to evaluate uh, what you're doing now because we see what kind of income we need to be generating off of the investment pool. Uh, we also need to see now, are we in the risk range that we want to be in a worst case scenario? If not, do we need to make adjustments? Again, we recognize that there are some opportunities here, but how do we structure things where we maximize some of those tax brackets and really get a good use of those funds? How do we make sure that we've positioned for healthcare in the way that we invest money to where we have the accessibility we need and on the right types of money? And then making sure that we follow up with you know, our clients here maybe make recommendations for estate planning attorneys that they can do some of these things and implement them. But a lot of times we're going to talk about that to help you figure out ultimately what it is that you're trying to do. So, you know, for us, when we sit down with somebody, we obviously want to walk you through this so that you can basically see how your life fits in here. But then our next meeting would be what I call a test and recommendations meeting. So, Again, from a fiduciary perspective, we have to look at the way that you're doing things now and see if you are, in fact, on the right track for all these different things that we uh, brought up before. So are we making enough income? Are we taking the right amount of risk? How is our tax positioning and how can we benefit from maybe putting investment and tax decisions together? If we're not where we want to be at, that's where we would come alongside you and make recommendations where if you decided to partner with us, these are the things that we would encourage you to do. This is why we would make those recommendations. And then at the end of that, you're going to know roughly what that cost would look like before you ever make a decision to work with us. So, because for us, what we're looking for is trying to add value to families through planning and helping you with managing portions of your investments. Uh, facilitating tax conversations, creating income plans, really any way that we can fit in there, but we're looking to kind of partner alongside you, not just create one-off plans. Um, you know, we want to be able to have that long-term relationship with people. And so if that's something that you maybe haven't been able to find, you know, we have been fortunate that not only have we been able to help families here locally in Tennessee, but we've been able to branch out through, you know, our, our efforts here on YouTube and reach other people that haven't had planning like this offered to them in their area. And so we would encourage you to click the link below, schedule a time, see how we do things, see if that could be a match for you. And ultimately, you know, try to figure out more about what it is that you're doing and if what we do is a match. 
Um, so again, thank you for your time today. Hopefully you learned a lot. Please leave some comments below with any questions that you have, and we'd be happy to you know, talk to you about that. And we look forward to coming out with another video and giving you some more content like this moving forward.